Good morning, we are the Rico family. Mm -hmm. Sara, Ezra is three, uh, three years old. Axel is five years old and Ezekiel is 60 months. And I'm Christian Rico. Where are we? We are camping in the Smoky Mountains. And we are part of the Trinity Church family and we want to welcome you to worship this morning. We hope that you can enjoy worship, connect with the Lord, learn a lot, and just feel a part of our family this morning. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good morning, Trinity. As we gather today to lift up the Lord's name in prayer and praise and sit beneath his word to be instructed, it is God himself who calls us into his very presence and invites us to worship. Hear these words from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 3 and 8 through 9. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Come, let us worship God.
Over the next few weeks, we'll be seeing how the Lord's Prayer calls us to a new type of culture. It creates for us a new type of environment. But in the spirit of Isaiah 6, we have to confess the sins of the culture and environment we live in. So, Lord, we confess that all week long we swim in a sea of anxiety. And we are battered by the cultural currents of self-aggrandizement, self-assertion, and the winds of judgment, negative scrutiny, and the waves of criticism and guilt and self-justification. And we confess that every day we have to navigate the demands of a touchy world, an active devil, and our own sinful tendencies. But Lord, we also confess that it's the power of the gospel to place us in a new environment. And it's the glory and the goal of the church to help us live in a new kind of a community, in a new atmosphere. So Lord, we ask that you would make your grace the atmosphere we live in and the air we breathe. Amen. So, 
So this morning we're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and we're actually going to be looking at Psalm 3 and a passage from Psalm 5. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 3 so you can be ready. But as you do, I want you to think about these past seven or eight months. Think about all that you've experienced, all that you've gone through, and think about what have been some of the most significant challenges that you've had to deal with during this time. And I think you can think through all this, the whole cycle of challenges. One of the biggest challenges is that in times like this, establishing and maintaining healthy rhythms or just a routine is so difficult. You know, it feels like every day just kind of bleeds into the next and there's no differentiation. So there's no weekends and there's no beginning of the week and start to the week. And, you know, the ways you mark your days now can be very different. You know, it's not quite as bad now, but I remember joking with people back in like June and they would say, you know, the only way I can tell one day from another is, did I work out today? Was today a day I worked out and took a shower? You know, for some of you, the only way to differentiate the days is, did I put on makeup today? And it's not quite as bad now as it was several months ago, but a couple months ago, Cynthia would joke that she'd be so excited for the days we would record because it meant she'd take a shower and put on an outfit. And uh, GQ ran an article back in June where it says, we've entered into the age of sweatpants, where everyone has gotten used to wearing sweatpants every day and we're never going back. And they were worried about jean companies that they might go bankrupt. But it shows, you know, in times like this, one of the big challenges is how do you deal with not having demarcated time, specific time for specific things? And it's also a challenge of how do you deal with not having demarcated space? So for many of you, you are now living and working and worshiping and playing all in the same space. So space designed to live in now has to be the place where you also work and go to school and worship and it shows us how much we need demarcated time and demarcated space and so for some people they love it they love working at home for others it's been a real challenge because it feels like it doesn't feel like you're working at home it feels like now you're living at work and so the question is why has this been such a challenge and what it points us to is how much we are creatures of habit, how much we need routine. And during the lockdown, one of the struggles was for a sense of control, a sense of routine, missing this sense of normalcy. And that's one of the things that people talk about when they talk about getting back to a, our normal or adjusting to the new normal. One of the things they mean is how do you deal with not having rhythm, routine set for your life? Now, why are we talking about this as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount? Because the Sermon on the Mount, uh, one of the key themes is to help us develop healthy relationships. Relationship with others, relationship with God, relationships with ourselves. And one of the things that we're going to see in uh, Matthew chapter 6 is that Jesus just assumes there's certain things we're going to do. He assumes that we're going to give to the poor. He assumes that we're going to pray. He assumes that we're going to fast. And we're in the section on prayer. And prayer is all about first having a healthy relationship with God. But then that relationship with God then filters into your relationship with others. And one of the things Jesus assumes is that we're going to have the routine of praying every single morning. That's the assumption behind the command to ask for our daily bread every day. So kind of our theme verse is Matthew chapter 6 verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. What Jesus is doing is he's assuming that you're going to ask for your daily bread every single day. And we're using that as a lens to look at the reality that we need regular rhythms, a regular routine of daily prayer. And so what does that look like? Where does it come from? And so today I want you to think about three things. I want to, we're going to think about the problem we encounter and then the pattern and then the pieces. So problem, pattern, pieces. And this time of lockdown has forced upon us the reality of a 
core fundamental problem in life. And that problem is how do you deal with the forces of chaos? And that problem goes back to the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The very problem with primordial creation. There's two key words there. It was that creation was formless and it was void. It was tohu vavohu. It was formless and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And so that's our core condition, that condition of chaos. And one of the ways to tell the biblical story is that God enters into that condition of chaos that's formless and void. There's no form, there's no shape, there's no structure, and then it's void. There's no energy, there's no life, there's no power. It's formless and void. That's chaos. And then God enters into the chaos and He gives us form, order, structure, and then he gives us life. And one of the things that this season has done is forced upon us the reality that we're just a very short step to chaos. It's always just around the corner. And the forces of chaos are those forces of formlessness and void. That there's no order, there's no structure, and then there's no life. So that's the problem. And into that problem, God comes with this rhythmic routine of evening and morning. God speaks, God sees, God acts, evening and morning. And so what we're going to look at today as we look at morning prayer, we're going to look at one of the primary tools God uses to combat the forces of chaos, the forces of being formless and void. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at the rhythm that is established in Psalm 3, 4, 5 of morning and evening prayer. So our primary text is going to be Psalm 3, and we're going to spend some time actually looking at that text. So grab the Bible, and we're going to go down stairs to the desk, and we're going to unpack that text for a few minutes. Actually, before we go down to the desk, let's set up the passage. So look at Psalm 3, Psalm 4, 5, 6, 7. This is all a sequence, and it gives a historical heading in Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. So let's get some of the historical background because I think that's really important to see what God's doing here. So Psalm 3, probably through Psalm 7, I would think, but at least 3, 4, and 5, um, the question is, how do you face a new day? How do you make it through the night? What God is doing here is Psalm 1 and 2 are an introduction to the whole Psalter, the whole book of Psalms. Psalm 1 sets the stage about who is, how you use this book, who's going to be blessed. You delight, you dwell, you meditate on the Word. Psalm 2 establishes uh, that the Messiah, the Anointed One, is King. He's ruling and reigning. And then Psalm 3 uh, plunges us right into the very difficult reality of what it means to be God's king. So here we find David in Psalm 3, and it's a day of we are instantly immersed into one of the most difficult seasons of his entire life. It's a day of difficulty, it's a day of trial, a day of fear, a day of fleeing, a day of fighting. So here you have David, he's on the run from his son Absalom. So remember the, the story. Absalom is leading an insurrection to overthrow his father David. Absalom's one of the beloved sons, but many people in the kingdom have turned on David. One of the reasons why is how poorly David has managed his own household and allowed uh, just these horrific events and activities to happen between his children. And all of the background is this, is from 2 Samuel uh, 15 through 17, that's the background. But just kind of get in the situation, David has to flee from the palace in the middle of the night. He's on the run, has to sneak out of the city, and so his future is uncertain. His name is being slandered all throughout the kingdom. His family is shattered. His entire life's work of building this kingdom and establishing the Lord's throne in Zion is in jeopardy. His home is in jeopardy. His life is in jeopardy. And so he's entering into one of the most unstable and chaotic times in his life. And so the question is, what is he going to do? When all of the world around him seems like it's slipping out of his control, 
what does he do? And what you find is that he is going to recommit himself to the practice of morning and evening prayer. And that's established, this pattern for us. You know, in some sense, this is a gift of shattered expectations, especially if you're just reading through the Psalms. So read through the Psalms and you read Psalm 2 and there's a sense of this mighty Messiah, the Lord's anointed, who will sit and rule on the throne and crush his enemies. And you think, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. The Lord's anointed is going to rule and reign. And then you're thrust in Psalm 3 into, you're plunged in this experience of the kingdom being stolen, of fleeing for your life. And you think, wait a second, it, sh- it shouldn't be this way. His life shouldn't be like this. And don't you know what it is to experience that sense of disorientation? Well, wait a second. The Lord promises good to His people, then why am I experiencing this? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening this way? And in times like this, this is a gift to us. So now, let's go down to the text. So here we are looking at Psalm 3. And what I want you to notice as we read through it is notice the structure. Notice the progression and the process. We're going to begin with the problem. That problem is going to be filtered through truth. Filtering it through truth is going to lead to assurance. Assurance will be followed by a confident prayer, which will then highlight the actual solution that we need. So we're going to follow through this path. Path towards from problem to solution. So, O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. So let's first look, let's do purple for the problem. So notice the problem, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul. And just how And look how honest David is about his actual problem. He begins with naming it, with calling it out. Many are my foes. They're rising. They're saying. So they're they're many. They're on the ascendancy, and they're very vocal. His enemies are real. They're strong. They're active. They're triumphant. They're confident. They're loud. Who are these foes? It's his son Absalom, his great counselor Ahithophel, all the generals, many of the generals. The people, they're all rising up against him. So he is very honest about the reality of his problems. They're serious. And then notice, look what they're attacking. They're saying there's no salvation for him in God. They're mocking his trust in God, his faith in God. God will not deliver him. Then notice there's a nice little beautiful, call that an inclusio. Salvation belongs to the Lord. There is no salvation in God. So here's the problem. He's honest. But now notice the next thing he does is he's going to filter the problem through truth. But you, O Lord, this is who you are. The affirmation in the face of all these hostile enemies, in the face of an uncertain future, in the face of possible death, in the face of despair, in the face of fleeing for his life and losing his home, He turns his focus from his problems, many, 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 from his problems to his Lord. His concentration shifts from himself to his Lord. And this is the first step with dealing with any trouble. This is the first step of dealing with any problem. And then notice the things about the Lord that he highlights. You're a shield, my glory, the lifter of my head. Shield, this is battle imagery, my protector. Glory. This is my hope. He's lost all his earthly glory, but he still has the only glory that matters. And then the lifter of my head. You know, so interesting. This is strong language. Protector. Battle. Warrior. This phrase is a tender phrase that is reference to what a mother does, to a nursing mother does to a young child, a baby. Lifts up its head when he's crying. Lifts up its head when he needs to eat. Lifts up its head when he needs to wake up. So he's going to filter his problem through the truth of who the Lord is. And he has this beautiful range of imagery that he's going to go to. My shield, my glory, the lifter of my head. And then because these things are true, now he can move to a place of assurance. Now notice the back and forth between what David does and what the Lord does. I cried. I laid down and slept. I woke again. I will not be afraid. I cried aloud to the Lord. 
What did he do? He answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept and I woke again. It's the Lord who sustains me. So I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. So here he is. I cried. The most common word for prayer in the Psalms is to cry. So here's the continual, continuing this baby imagery of I lay down in his lap. I cried out to him. He answers. I slept. You know, that's amazing. Where does peace come from to rest and to be able to sleep when your problems are this many and this real? But he lies down and, and sleeps in perfect peace. And then he woke again. Why? Because the Lord sustained him. You can translate that supported him. That's also the imagery of like the Lord was his pillow. It supported him. And you know, one of the things that amazes me about this is I'm just amazed at the language. I mean, you know, David used all this intimate, resting language. And it's kind of one thing for a four-year-old to talk about this. You know, a couple nights ago, we were having a Well, I was about to say it was a Bailey family movie night, but it wasn't. We were watching the Braves because they're in the playoffs. And I look over at about the sixth inning and Benjamin is laying in Cynthia's lap. She's scratching his back and rubbing his head and he's completely out. And he just looked angelic. He's lying in the lap of his mother and everything is right with the world. And it also helped that the Braves were winning. But for a brief second, I I was envious of that kind of peace that kind of calm, that kind of rest. And what's so amazing is David is using that very same imagery to talk about how he's feeling when he's on the run for his life. And David's not a kid. He's not a child. It's kind of hard to recreate the recreate the chronology of David's life, but he's at least in his late 50s at this point, somewhere between probably 58 and 62. And he's using that type of imagery and language. It's amazing. And then Notice, so the problem gets filtered through truth, which leads to assurance, and what flows out of that assurance is prayer. But passionate prayer, feel the energy, arise, Lord, save me. Look what he's calling out for. These are the things he's asking them to do. Arise, save me, strike, break. I mean, this is energetic, passionate prayer. He says, strike all my enemies on the cheek, break the teeth of the wicked. Now, this cry is for God to rise up, to act, to deal with these problems and strike on the cheek. Remember, we'd see that in the turn the other cheek. That's to rebuke them, put them in their place and then break the teeth of the wicked. What's that all about? You know, is David anti-dentistry? So for all you orthodontists who are listening, this is not a slight on your noble profession. Break the teeth of the wicked. This means to like defang to remove their power. The wicked are like lions, they're tigers, they're venomous snakes, and to break their teeth means to destroy their means of power, to disarm them. And then it moves into the actual solution, from prayer to solution. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He's going to experience the very thing that they're claiming isn't real. He knows he'll experience it. And then not just him, but then the blessings will be on the people. Salvation comes from the Lord, and then the blessings extends to all his people. So notice this pattern, this progression. You start with the problem, and you're real, and you're honest. You filter it through the truth of who the Lord is, and that brings about tremendous confidence and courage and rest. And then from there, you move to a place of passionate, energetic, honest praying, and then that opens up a window or light into the actual solution. So in times of chaos, in times of uncertainty, this routine, the rhythm of morning and evening prayer is such a gift to us because what it is, is the gift of agency. See, in times of chaos, it feels like everything's spiraling out of control and that's the feeling. It's out of control and you're grasping, looking for, is there anything that I can actually control? And what God is giving you here is the gift of agency. So when when you're entering into the chaos, here's what you can do. You can focus on this. You can pray every single day and focus on this day and ask the Lord, provide what I need this day. 
And every prayer you pray during seasons of seeming chaos, you're actually planting a seed in the ground that will be the fruit of your future. You're planting future seeds. So there's so many things about the future you just don't know. But every prayer is planting seeds in times of uncertainty that you know will bloom, that will bear fruit. So I love that last verse. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing, it's going to be on your people. Your people will experience blessing and the prayers in the seasons of uncertainty are planting seeds that will flower. And this gift of agency, you know, it's in times of uncertainty, you know, we want to know. And this is very hard for everyone, especially you who are planners. You like to plan. You want to know. When will we be able to meet again? When will we be able to do this? Will I be able to go to this place? Will we be able to meet in the office or this? And you, you want to know. And then the mind starts to spin with all of the logistics. And the simple answer for so many of the questions we have is we do not know. And in times of chaos, one of the gifts that the Lord can give us is can bring us to a place of rest even when we don't have knowledge or a place of rest even when you don't have clarity. What he says in this season, what you can do is you can focus on today. Focus on today. And every day you do that, you're actually planting and watering seeds that eventually will grow or will bloom. And the seeds you want to bloom are joy, dependence, hope, trust. See, David had learned in all of his wilderness wanderings and escaping, he had learned 20 years earlier what it meant to trust the Lord in the wilderness. And then now when he needed to know that the most, he had that lesson ready. He knew what to do. Now let's transition. I want to look at the third thing just from a verse from uh, Psalm chapter 5. So you can look at Psalm 5. And let's talk a little bit about the pieces you need for the rhythm, the routine, the pieces. Now, Psalm 3 establishes the morning prayer, the rhythm of morning prayer. Psalm 4 gives us an illustration of evening prayer. And those are to provide the two fixed forms of prayer to give shape to our day. So that brings order to the chaos. But that's not the only thing we need. We need order, and then we need ardor. Or we need freedom, and we need form. We need structure, and then we need spontaneity and energy and life. So you think about the two enemies, the two aspects of that one enemy of chaos is that it's formless, no form, no structure, and then it's void, no life. And what you find is God will give you both, and you need both. You need form, and that's what the morning and evening gives, form. But then you also need life. You need energy. You need passion. You need zeal. We need both of those things. And you can see both of those things perfectly illustrated in Psalm 5, verse 3. O Lord, in the morning you will hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. So in the morning... You'll hear my voice and I prepare or I order. This is a word for preparing, for ordering. It's the same word that is used for Abraham when he prepares the sacrifice in Genesis 22. Same word that's used for David as he would prepare his military companies. He would set them in order. Uh, Same word used in Isaiah 44 that talks about accountants, the way they order their accounts to be neat and orderly. So it's talking about order. And then, but you read all throughout Psalm 4 and Psalm 5 and Psalm 3, you see it, and there's all these words for ardor, for energy, for emotion. To you I cry. Do you hear my groanings, my longings, the laments, the anguish? And those are the two parts or the two pieces that we need for vibrant, healthy worship. You need order and you need ardor. You need structure, and then you need spontaneity or energy or life. And that's exactly how God defeats the chaos in Genesis chapter 1. Days 1, 2, and 3, he provides form, which structure and systems are put in place. And then days 4, 5, and 6, he fills those with life. And so you think about it. If you want to battle the chaos in your life, you need both of those things. And now all of us have a tendency to lean towards one or the other. 
And this is why we structure our worship the way we do. This is absolutely vital to have healthy, dynamic, vibrant worship. You need order, and then you need ardor. And some of us lean more towards being order people. We like things structured. We like to know how it's going to go and like it to be very predictable. And then some of us lean more towards being ardor people. We like energy and passion. And oftentimes the two can kind of look with suspicion on the other. So the order people, maybe you're an order person, you know, maybe you grew up Presbyterian and you're used to everything being done decently and in order. And you like, like order, like structures. And your tendency can be to look at the people who are more passionate, ardor, energy, and kind of think, oh, those loons who run around waving their hands, waving flags, dancing up and down. You know, it's so crazy. But actually, don't turn your nose up at them because you need them. You need them to help you come alive and not become numb. You need the ardor. But then there's, there's probably some of you maybe lean to a more charismatic perspective who like the energy and the passion and you come into a worship service that's more ordered and you think, oh, look at these frozen, chosen. They're so dry and stale and they have no energy and no life. Where's their passion? Don't turn your nose up at them either. You need their order. You need their structure. We both need each other. You need to have order that gives shape and stability and structure, but then we also need ardor, energy, life. And both of those are found here in the Psalms. That's why the Psalms are such a beautiful gift to us. That's why we actually order worship the way we do. We try and have a stable and steady order, and then we pray every week that the Lord will then fill it with life. Fill it with energy and passion. And so you can think about your life in this season. You know, what do you need most right now? One of the challenges in this season, the way we're battling chaos, is for many of us, our order, that, and often for many of us it was imposed on us, it's not something we actually chose or created, has been taken away. So now we have no order to life. There's no rhythm. There's no routine. And so what we need is to ask the Lord to help us Help us impose structure on our day. Help us impose order. And one of the great gifts for that, one of the primary things that he gives us is the order of morning and evening prayer. That's why in the temple, in the sacrifices, there was always morning and evening sacrifice. They were to draw them into that rhythm of morning and evening prayer. So what I want to do now is I want to walk us through... Psalm 3, and walk us through that order to give shape and structure to our prayers. But before we do, just, just think a moment about how David's experience foreshadows his greater son's experience. See, in some sense, David only knows a sliver of what the true king would experience. You know, Think about Jesus' life, how... You know, go back through Psalm 3 and read through with a lens of thinking about how it expresses the reality that Jesus experienced. I mean, Jesus would know what it was like to have everyone conspiring against him and have people be very confident that the Lord would not deliver him and to mock him. But Jesus also demonstrates what it's like to be able to rest in times of chaos and anxiety. You know, one of my favorite stories is when the disciples are on the boat and they're passing through the storm and they're panicking. They're thinking they're going to die. And these are professional fishermen. If they're scared, everybody should be scared. Kind of like if you're ever on a plane and you see the pilot start to panic, guess what? You should panic too. <laughs> and, and yet, what is Jesus doing? He's asleep because he shows us what it means to be able to rest in times of chaos and then night after night, he personally experienced what is true. One of the things about this passage that's so profound is, I mean, think, like, how, how would I explain this to a seven-year-old? And I'm pointing over there because Annabelle's on the other side of the camera. But how do I explain this? She's waving at everybody. How do I explain this to a seven-year-old? Thinking, because what this psalm does is this psalm says, you have to shape your subjective experience you have to filter it through what's objectively true. What is objectively true about him must be the 
defining thing that shapes how you subjectively experience the world. And I hadn't quite figured out how to explain that to a seven-year-old, but the reality is because God is, therefore I will. Or because God is, therefore I have. Because God is is these things. He is my shield. He is my glory. He is the one who is the lifter of my head. That's who he is. That's objectively true and has nothing to do with my situation or circumstance. And because he is, therefore, I will rest. I will lie down and sleep. I will have peace. I will overcome my enemies. I will have more joy in the morning. I will have these things. But here points us to the things we need. It highlights the problem. The problem is chaos. Things are formless and void. And so we need help imposing form. And we need the Spirit to give life. And then it gives us the pattern that we'll walk through. And then it gives us the two pieces. So let's take a moment now and let's pray through Psalm 3. Now let's take a moment and let's walk through that pattern that we saw in Psalm 3. And so the pattern was problem, truth, assurance, prayer, solution. So let's take a moment, pray, and let's begin with the problem. What's your problem right now? What are you facing? Is it like David, where you have many foes, many difficulties, many problems, and they're surrounding you and swirling? Or are your problems very minor? Whatever they are, bring them before the Lord. And then what truth do you need to know that you can filter those problems through? Is there a certain specific truth of who the Lord is and what He's done that speaks to your specific problem and situation? If not, use the three that David used here in our psalm. That the Lord is His shield. He will protect Him. The Lord is His glory. No matter what else He loses in this life, He has the only thing that matters. And the Lord is the lifter of His head. He's the one who comforts Him. He's the one who nourishes and takes care of Him. How would your life be different today if you knew down in your bones that the Lord is the one who protects you. He's your glory. He lifts your head when you're downcast. And then ask the Lord to make those realities give birth to assurance in your life so you can lie down and sleep. You can rise again in confidence. You can have mental and emotional and cognitive rest. And then now, bring your request before him. In light of the problem and in light of who he is, what do you need? Ask him to rise up. Ask him to act. Ask him to do the only things that the only thing that he can do. And then now pause and praise him for the solution. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessings, his blessings, will be upon his people. They will see. Weeping lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That is our hope, and that is His glory.
precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the of a dying Savior, the power of a risen Savior, and the hope of a returning Savior be yours this day, this week, now, and always. Stay in peace. <laughs>